yesterday we have had this discussion on uh, the chartered accountants, cost accountants, cost and work works uh, accountants and the company secretaries amendment uh, bill. The Minister of State has been uh, seated in this house following the debates whilst unfortunately I couldn't be here as I had a reply to uh, give on the finance bill in the Rajya Sabha. It was the longest reply in Rajya Sabha. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But there was also very interesting and detailed because. discussions. Sir. So I thought it only right that I give reply for the issues raised by the honourable members. And so is the, the spirit of the discussion on this bill here uh, since yesterday. And uh, I'll seek your indulgence for giving a bit of an elaborate reply because many of the issues have been raised in uh, great detail and uh, calibration. So permit me to be a bit uh, elaborate on my reply. So the current set of amendments for not just one of the institutes, but for three simultaneously, the Chartered Accountants Institute, the Cost and Works Accountants Institutes, and also the Institute of Company Secretaries, uh, are being brought in as a consolidated one set of uh, amendments as one amendment bill. Let me start by addressing that concern which was voiced by one of the members. That how come you're bringing all the three together? Are they going to be governed by all the three together as one act? No, sir, there's no proposal at all. To have a single legislation for all the three institutes. They will be governed as they are governed now by their respective uh, Acts, there are three separate acts, and they will be governed by the three separate acts. So there will be a coordination committee. Yes. Please, please. Sir, so uh, they will be governed uh, by their respective separate acts. And this is just a consolidated amendments bill. And why should it be in one bill? Because largely, while the acts are separate, three different. They are worded and the spirit of uh, the flow of the acts are comparable and therefore the amendments which are brought in so that there is a greater co um, uh, comparability between the functioning of the three. The amendment is being brought in as one separate but one integrated bill. And these amendments have not been brought in as it is without much of a work. Quite some time different committees have gone into it. Uh, particular and the recent, most recent one being the Meenakshi Datta Ghosh Committee, which had come up with several recommendations. It was formed in 2017, sometime in April, and which had given its recommendation by, 17, uh, by 2017, September itself. And many of these recommendations given by the Meenakshi Datta Ghosh Committee, with minor tweakings, have been brought into this act. So why is it that we're bringing it now? And of course, after quite a lot of consultation is, in the last eight years, we've witnessed considerable change, progress, growth, and also economic development with a lot of legislative support coming in uh, to make it easy for companies, both for entry and for exit. The IBC code and periodically amending the IBC Code. As you know, this House is quite aware that we've come periodically to amend the IBC Act and also to make it uh, sure that IBC Act or the Companies Act, which also went through quite a few amendments, and the LLP Act, all of them represent the rapidly changing economic profile and also making sure there's more space given for uh, LLPs, for instance, under which come the startups and so on. So. Since the LLPs are also gaining uh, a good space in the economy, it was necessary for us to have a robust audit certification um, from the professionals. Now, it is also important that 
audit certification and also the quality of audit, therefore, will have to be kept in mind and improved so that there is a favorable investment climate in the country. And above all, when all of us are looking towards greater transparency, greater, better managed, board-driven managed companies, and so on, the sanctity of an audited financial statement gains so much of an importance that we need all the stakeholders, whether they are promoters, whether they are investors, whether they are, uh, you know, the employees, all of them should have greater confidence in the kind of statements which the audited uh, statement is certified by a chartered professional and therefore at this time if there is a necessity for reviewing the SR the self-regulatory kind of a mechanism with which most of these institutes function we are only doing it because we'll be globally aligning ourselves most of the countries whether it is the US or the UK or uh, Australia Canada South Africa all of them have such systems. In fact, in the United States of America, every state has its own body, and not just one, there are many bodies within that, and the governor of the state appoints many of these members who regulate these bodies and so on. So the world has moved further and further away to have a greater transparent, accountable, and also a process in which everybody sits in to judge and also to see how the functioning happens. And therefore, at this time for India to look at how these three uh, institutions can be, because they are very important pillars of uh, corporate governance, especially together with the board of a company and the management of the company, this would be the third most important pillar for greater professionally managed and efficiently managed companies. And that is why we need to have these uh, amendments brought in and brought in because also, from 2006 globally, you see an international awareness and also a body which now has come together of independent regulators and uh, it is a big forum, the International Forum of Independent Regulators is also now coming to say what are the guidance that uh, globally we can give to each other, which are the best practices which can be adopted. And therefore, we have uh, thought it fit that at this stage we come up with this uh, uh, consolidated amendment bill. I understand also that concerns have been expressed by members. If this is going to compromise the autonomy of these institutions, and uh, in particular, if the coordination committee which is coming in will change uh, the way in which the independent functioning has been affected all these years, will that get affected or will that get compromised? I want to state up front, sir, that there is no proposal here or no intention here to impinge upon the autonomy of these three institutions. Not at all. There is no proposal, nor, ev nor even a, a faint intent to uh, um, dilute the autonomy of these three institutions. The three institutes at present are responsible for all the functions concerning the qualification, licensing and regulation of their conduct. And they will continue to perform those functions. Let this be recorded. They will continue to perform those functions. As regards the fee from the students and the institutes had earlier also the full powers, that is also not being touched. So even that will continue. In fact, the council is being given full autonomy to decide fee as regards registration of members and certificate of practice. At present, to increase the fee for registration of members and certificate of practice beyond a, limited, uh, beyond a limit prescribed in the Act, approval of the government is required. But this is being dispensed with. The council will have full powers to fix even such fees. In fact, that is being given, and the government, which had an uh, indirect role in it, where, uh, um, wherein after a point the council had to come back, that is also being given back to the council. The council will also be continuing to administer the funds as per the provisions of Section 18, 
and there will be no government role in that as well. So there is actually no change even in the composition of the council responsible for the management of the affairs of the institutes. Sir, in the proposed amendment, sir, the council shall continue to constitute these bodies, the board of discipline and the disciplinary committee, as per the existing practice. Government will not constitute them. I'd like to reiterate that government will not constitute them. Sir, there will also be no Nothing change in the number of members in <clears throat> these bodies. However, sir, majority will be of non-members of the institute, which is the global best practice which we want to bring in here. Being elected members, sir, president and vice president shall not be heading the disciplinary committees, and the council members shall not head the board of uh, discipline uh, to avoid conflict of interest. That probably therefore under, uh, replies, responds to some of the questions which are being raised even before I've started speaking, sir. So the collaboration and the greater responsibility to the Council of the Institute for nomination of experts and persons of eminence has been proposed and that is through these amendments rather than taking away their powers. So, in a way, it is they who give the names and it is that which gets appointed. Uh, very quickly, just to uh, get a picture of what we are talking about. So, in the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, the Board of Discipline, uh, Discipline the BOD, existing position since 2006, sir, is the BOD is a three-member body. There is a presiding member officer who is a council member, one member who is nominated by the government, one member who is nominated by the council. What we propose in this uh, set of amendments is for the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, the presiding officer shall be a non-CA nominated by the government from out of the panel prepared and provided by the council itself. One member who will be a non-CA nominated by the government, again, from out of the panel prepared and provided by the council itself. The other member will be nominated by the council from out of a panel of members of the institute to be prepared by the council. Now, if this is the proposal, and this again falls back on the council itself to propose the names, give the panel, from which the government appoints somebody. And having a non-CA as presiding officer he is very much in line with the global best practices. And if people have asked a question saying, how will a non-CA understand what the whole thing is about? It's a technical thing. They may not be able to understand. Absolutely not founded at all, sir. They, it has no, these doubts don't have a basis because everywhere else in the world, a lay person sits as a chair while the other members are all CAs and they can always guide the council or the BOD to take a call. And this brings in greater transparency, a greater fresh outsider's uh, approach to the issue. So in the disciplinary committee, sir, if this is what is on the BOD, the disciplinary committee, uh, which is a five-member body, the existing uh, composition since 2006, is that the presiding officer is a president or vice president of the council itself. Two members are nominated by the council. Two members otherwise are nominated by the government. So that is the existing structure. Now, what we have proposed in this set of amendments is that the presiding officer shall be a non-CA nominated by the government, but from out of the panel prepared and provided by the council. Two other members are non-CAs nominated by the government again, again from, the, uh, from out of the panel which is prepared and provided by the council. 
Then two members are nominated by the council from out of the panel of members. The institute shall prepare this panel of uh, names being prepared. Sir, I move, uh, similar is the structure for the company secretaries and the cost accountants institutes also. So I very quickly move to the related issue. Uh, Honorable Chair, when you from there asked, saying, won't, won't it defeat the purpose of avoiding conflict of interest between the administrative and the disciplinary arm of the institute? A, a, a very um, uh, concerned question. And I wanted to answer this by saying the panel of the presiding officers sir, and the lay members will be prepared by the council in accordance with the regulations which will be framed. So they'll have to go by that. They will be experts in the different fields as mentioned in the bill. So it's not going to result in conflict of interest because the regulations will guide them. The proposed amendments in the three acts governing the three professional institutes without compromising their autonomy seeks to make uh, the councils or the institutes themselves more responsive and, uh, and accountable. And therefore, these uh, steps are being taken with a conscious attempt to make sure that we are neither undermining the autonomy nor are we bringing a situation of conflict of interest, which is a question which you have uh, very rightly raised, sir. Sir, as regards the um, coordination committee, Professor Saugata Roy has been very concerned about it from the minute I started speaking. As, as per the proposed bill, the coordination committee will comprise of the president, the vice president, and the secretaries of the three institutes, quarterly meeting of which shall be held under the chairpersonship of the secretary, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, which is the administrative ministry of all the three institutes. It may be noted here, and I think it's very important for us to uh, seize this fact, that the two other institutes, Institute of Cost Accountants of India and IC, SI have not objected to the constitution of such a committee. After all, when we did stakeholders consultation, all the institutes gave their respective in, uh, input, and the ICSI and the uh, cost accountants did not have an objection. The ICAI, in a meeting dated 23 September 2019, under the chairmanship of the Secretary of Corporate Affairs, had also agreed for the constitution of a coordination committee. Now, the coordination committee, sir, has been proposed for the development and harmonization of the three professions, and uh, therefore, uh, this is not going to undermine them. In fact, uh, if I can move uh, quickly on giving comparable examples, IAMs among themselves have a coordination committee. Indian Institute of Management. IAMs have a committee among themselves, coordination committee. Triple IT also has a coordination committee among themselves. And these have actually been very effective in having greater synergy among these institutes. And in fact, if I may highlight, and it might be time appropriate for me to highlight, that the Triple IT's committee, the coordination committee, is headed by the minister himself. So this worry that, you know, the, that uh, profession's uh, person with expertise in that field, experience in the field, only can sit as a chairman is uh, completely disproved by the fact that the triple IT's uh, chairman is the minister himself. So the, uh, similarly, the point that I would like to highlight here is in the year 2000, the ICSI, that is the Company Secretaries Institute and the ICAI, Chartered Accountants Institute, uh, and also the Institute of Cost Accountants among themselves formed a coordination committee through an MOU. So it's not as if this is the first time they are bringing a coordination committee. In the year 2000, through an MOU, these three institutes formed a coordination committee, but it has not just taken off. Actually, the absence of coordination is what is standing out, despite this having been formed in 2000 uh, through an MOU. So. Uh, and again, to highlight for the reference of the honorable members, coordination committee will not be issuing directives at all 
it is more to manage the funds of the institute and other things which people tend to doubt, doubt if there will be a direction given by the coordination committee about how resources will have to be used. No, not at all. It's not going to be doing that. And therefore, that aspect, the governance and the, uh, the management of the resources of the institutes are going to be governed by Section 18, which is the practice which is existing now. Also, sir, a non-standing committee. For us, uh, who are constantly referring to standing committee in the parliament, this expression was a bit of a uh, discomforting one for me, but that is it. It is called the non-standing committee um, of a particular institute which has been proposed by the ICAI, saying you can have a particular institute having a non-standing committee and have this uh, taken care of. Uh, when we started talking about the absence of a statutory backing for this kind of a thing, uh, this was suggested saying a non-standing committee could work in that place. Sir, in order to make the coordination effective, I think it's important that periodic meetings with a given structure is held, and that is only possible uh, through a very institutionalized framework, and that is why we thought we should go through uh, this route. So there, I move slightly to a different issue, sir, that Again, on the composition of the BOD and the DC has been repeatedly raised by all members. I think uh, the global best practice is something which I already mentioned. Globally, the conduct of chartered accountants, particularly who are auditors of public interest entities, public interest entities being those which have a certain stipulation, if I can just go to... Um, Take them in specific. What are public interest entities, sir? They are, first of all, listed companies, sometimes even unlisted companies, but which have over 500 crore paid up capital, or which are over 1,000 crores of annual turnover, or those with over 500 crores in terms of loans, debentures, and deposits. So these are the public interest entities. So globally, auditors who deal with public interest entities are regulated by independent regulators. I'll just name a few for it. In the United States of America, it's the PCAOB, the FRC in UK, the ASCII, the ASCI in Australia, the IRBA in South Africa, the CPAB in Canada, all of whom are independent regulators. So even in India, uh, on similar lines, we set up, I think in 2018, the NFRA, the National Financial Reporting Authority. The full-time members of NAFRA at present are not members of the institute. So if NAFRA, which deals with auditors of public interest entities, both listed and unlisted because of the size of the operations. The proposed amendments which aims to bring that independence and autonomy with members who are not members of those institutes also becoming a part of the disciplinary committee, I think we are only matching ourselves with global best practices. And there's nothing to worry if we are undermining our institutions. On the contrary, we'll be strengthening them because greater independence, greater transparency, and greater outsider uh, looking into the affairs of the bodies. As I said earlier, sir, the International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators, which was a body which has come into, the, uh, come into existence in sometime 2006, have been suggesting these, and we are only aligning our, ourselves with the global best, best practice. Also, the guiding principles which have been given by the International Federation of Accountants is also something uh, which is an international NGO, and uh, it's a global advocacy uh, organization. In fact, the ICA, ICAI, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, are a member of this International Federation of Accountants, and they have given these uh, guidelines. So we are taking that on board. Again, coming to the 
good work which standing committees of our parliament do in these regards. 2003, sir, the standing committee on finance, uh, whose tenure was between 2004 and 5, in its 11th report, discussed a lot of these uh, amendments. And uh, I would like to quote one uh, few sentences from there. Quote, the committee recommend that uh, such a body should be headed by a person not below the rank of a joint secretary belonging to the legislative service. Two members should be from the council and two shall be outside experts from the field of law and accountancy, unquote. So that's the standing committee of this house sometime in 2005 mentioning the same thing and it has taken us nearly 15 years to arrive at that step now. As I said earlier, in UK, the United States, South Africa uh, have all adopted this and it is not something which we are doing for the first time. So there were questions raised about why a complaint pending completion of inquiry is being kept in public domain, which is also going to be enabled now. So this is a question which Honorable Member uh, Bhattruhari Metabji raised, Adirji raised, saying putting status of actionable complaints in public domain or entering them into the register of members, does, uh, would it raise doubts about uh, how the member is being treated? Will it be victimizing him? Will there be an element of harassment and so on? That's not the intent at all, sir, and does not intend to victimize the member. The manner and the interval of putting such information out in public domain and also entering in the register of members shall be in accordance with the regulations framed by the council itself. So there cannot be an element of discretion saying, I don't like somebody, so I'm going to put them there and uh, publicly shame them or uh, victimize them. Cannot happen. It may be noted that the two other institutes, which is the company accounts and also the um, company secretaries, have not at all objected to this proposal. So mind application has happened from the different institutes, and we've gone only in the direction in which majority opinion has emerged. So the rationale for provision of audit by a panel of auditors maintained by CNAG was raised by Honorable Member Supriya Sule. She questioned as to why this should happen. Sir, at present, the ICAI, as per the provisions of the existing Chartered Accountants Act, the Council may appoint any auditor to audit its, its own annual account. And in this proposed amendment that we are bringing in now, we have provided that the Institute will appoint an auditor from a panel of auditors which is maintained by the Constitutional Authority, which is the CAG. So, you can always pick up an auditor. Maybe that auditor is already in the list of CAG. That's fine. But now we are saying, turn it this way around. Please do pick it up from that panel of auditors which is listed by the CAG, which is a constitutional body, just gives a greater heft to the audit of the <coughs> institutes. And therefore, it's, I think, a progressive step towards bringing greater transparency. And again, on this matter as well, uh, the, ICE, the company secretary's institute, as a matter of practice, is getting audit done through a panel of auditors maintained by the CAG already. So if one of them is doing it, it might be a best practice that others also adopt. So there were uh, legitimate concern about why the term of the council members, the Chartered Accountants Council, is being reduced, whether it would limit the chances of others and so on. Just for the clarity, sir, 
At present, the term of the council of the chartered account, ICAI, is for three years. And a member can remain a member for another three cons consecutive terms, which means a total period of nine years. The ICAI has been demanding to increase the term of the council for a long time. They've been asking for it for a very, very long time. Further, the term of the council in the company uh, accountants of India and the ICSI is already four years. It's already four years. The provision in the CA Act for the ICAI is being aligned with the rest too. So while the term of the council is being enhanced to four years, from three years, the term of a member is being restricted from three terms to two terms. So the, in the place of nine years, which he was otherwise entitled in the present dispensation, a member can remain in the council only for eight consecutive years. So two terms, four plus four, four, eight years, substantial time for doing great service and reform. So there was this distinction made between an auditor, the individual, and an audit firm. Currently, sir, there is no provision for a separate register of firm and proceedings against the misconduct of firms in the three acts. Currently, in this consolidated amendment bill that we are placing before the House, this is now being brought in. So auditors could have been acted upon till now, and they can continue to be acted upon even now per the three individual acts. But firms could not be touched, whereas what we are bringing in here is that provision which will give them the ability to be able to touch the firms as well, not just the audit, in case of gross omission and commission, which they may want to take up. So the last few uh, inputs, sir. The Quality Review Board. On that, questions were raised as to why they should recommend cases to the disciplinary directorate. I think it was uh, Rahul Shevaleji who raised this question. I can't see him here. So ICAI, during consultations, wanted this provision. In course of review of quality audit reports sometimes, the QRB comes across irregularities in audit reports. Through this amendment, the QRB may refer such matters to disciplinary directorate to proceed against members in such, of such auditors. So it is a provision which gives one more window for recommendation from the QRB for action to be taken. Sir, I think it was member, I can't see whether he's here, Thomas Charikaran. Who, oh, yes, sorry. He had raised this question, sir, about bar councils and also these institutions now which are getting regulated. Is there a comparison of the disciplinary mechanism of the institutes like bar council, council of architecture, NMC and so on? So bar councils are not a monolith body. Since they are, uh, there are multiple state bar councils having disciplinary committees in each state unlike the chartered accountants, cost accountants, and the CS institutes. So multiple bodies exist already in them, not here. Moreover, these three institutes are performing all the functions together, including students registration, enrollment, conduct of examinations, registration of members, licensing and regulation of their conduct, unlike the legal profession where multiple colleges ex exist, they can recruit, enroll students, train them, put them on, and then they become the member of bar council. Whereas here, that function, inclusive of profession, inclusive of discipline, everything is done by this one monolith. That's the essential difference other than... of India is... <laughs> Madam. <laughs> so the Council of Architecture, sir. 
the Council of Architecture, sir, is constituted by the central government, and the disciplinary committee to inquire into the misconduct of architects has two non-elected representatives in it as members and one elected member unlike the Council of CA, the cost accountants, and so on. So it already has that provision. Further, sir, the NMC Act, as was discussed above, prescribes for Sir, NMC Act, sir, which I have explained earlier, prescribes for state regulation and constitution of SMEs, uh, SMCs and the Ethics and Medical Reg uh, Registration Board to reg regulate the medical profession from, by the government. Uh, whereas the CA, CWA, CS Act prescribes for statutory self-regulation. That's the point I said at the very beginning, sir. The SRO, the self-regulatory organizations, format itself has gone through rapid change globally. Um, huh, sir, sure. <laughs> so, um, there's this uh, very legitimate question that CA firms should be aspiring to be big, global big four is there, can India not have a equivalent of a global big four. Honorable Prime Minister himself has been, while discussing with the institutions, engaging with them, saying, is it not possible for India to have, aspire to have one in the big four? So the government has enabled institutes, sir, to enter into mutual recognition agreements and MOUs of institutes from various different countries through various Cabinet approved approvals. The amendments like registration of firms will allow the audit firm to grow. So we have enough facility and provisions which we have brought in wherein the big global firms can also be uh, matched up by Indian firms which can come into play. Uh, Huh? Now you can't. I mean, you haven't seen it. You, at least in the last 70 years, we have not even found one large such uh, firm which can compete. Huh? Bilkul? 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 Adir ji, aapko badai mein de rahi hoon. Nay, nay, aapi hoga na? Ye amendment ke dwara hoga, badai de rahi hoon aapko. Poore. This amendment ke dwara aur pichle 7 saal mein sarkar ease of doing business ke liye jitne bhi facilitation kiya hai aur mujhe bahut anand ho rahi hai sir ki vipaksh ke neta iska saransh pure samajh gaya aur ye bol rahe ki modi ji hai to mumkin hai bilkul mumkin hai sir माने मंत्री जी आप उनके भाषण में अपना बोलते रहो ना आप उनके वक्त पे क्यों सुन रहे हैं नहीं आ, आ, मैंने उनको अलाउ नहीं किया है अभी तो आप क्यों हैं नहीं आपकी सलाह की आवश्यकता है क्या आदिर जी के आवाज के लिए माइक की जरूरत जरूरत नहीं है सर मैं तो बैठ जाती हूँ बार बार आपके इंटरफेरेंस होने के बावजूद भी फिर परमिशन लेता हूँ चेयर से आ, मैंने परमिशन नहीं दिया आपको आप तो बोलते रहे मैं कभी भी डंडा हूँ सर इतना गर्माहट के लिए कुछ आवश्यकता ना होती है रनिंग कॉमेंट्री होते रहते हैं मुझे परवाह नहीं करते हैं उसको सर इसीलिए आई थिंक आई हैव ट्राइड आंसरिंग द इश्यूज रेस्ड बाय ऑनरेबल मेंबर्स very critical and very crucial points which have been raised maine thoda zyada hi elaborate kiya aapki anumati lekar ke main manti hu ye samay ke uchit amendment hai isse chartered accountancy cost accountancy aur company secretary sab ek platform par aa jayenge aur desh ke is development ke raftar mein ye sab aise professionally better rehne mein 
हमारे डेवलपमेंट का अच्छा स्पीड मिलेगा